Yeah, for some terrifying reason, I'm seeing one person in my waiting room. So I hope that Colin, when they, when you allow all them in. Looks like we're right at 1159. Can you hear me, Cheryl? Can. Yeah. I can't, Melissa, I can't you hear have, you. You can't hear me? I'm not I, can hear both, I can hear both of you. All right, I'm, all right, I'm letting everybody in. Okay, I can hear now. Looks like the room. Good afternoon, everyone. Looks like everyone's starting to come in. I'm gonna wait just a few moments to give everyone time to join. Looks like it's really filling up. A lot of respect for everyone's time. I'll go ahead and kick things off. Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Anderson. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today um, to talk about the fentanyl crisis, treatment, recovery, and solutions. I know everybody's likely got a busy, a busy schedule as we're heading in towards the Labor Day weekend. So thank you for taking your lunch hour to interact with us. Um, I'll be joined today by Dr. McLean, uh, but the both of us would like to keep this very interactive. So if there is a, a question or something that you would like us to clarify, please feel free, raise your hand, put something in the chat, and we'd be happy to stop, take those questions. And I think that's a more engaging discussion than just a, uh, a didactic. But just to introduce ourselves, like I said, I'm Melissa Anderson. Um, Physician pharmacist by training, a director of public policy and advocacy for Brightview Health. My undergraduate degree is in analytical chemistry. So jack of all traits, master of none. And you'll hear the uh, you'll hear my Appalachian accent sneaking out today, regardless of how much I try to tuck it in. Um, but I've been with Brightview now for a about a year and a half. And I work with pretty much every, every department in terms of coordinating policy in different, different realms of federal and state advocacy. Because in behavioral health and addiction treatment, state law, federal law policies are always changing. So, and we have to adjust our treatment model based upon those changes. And how do we make sure that we can serve everyone who needs help? So it's it's never a dull never a dull moment in that in that realm, but I'll let uh, Dr. McLean introduce herself now. Appreciate that, um, Dr. Anderson, and I am uh, Dr. Sean McLean. I've been with Brightview for uh, a little over a year and a half. Currently, the Kentucky Medical State uh, Director here at Brightview, and, and very happy to be alongside Dr. Anderson and a part of this discussion today. That um, I know that we're all. Kind of on board and, and worried about and, and need some more information and um, certainly appreciate your time as well. Um, I hope you're munching on something for lunch and feel free to do that. Raise your hand uh, if you have any questions. As Dr. Anderson mentioned, we're going to keep this formal. We're going to uh, try to get through all the information. We've got a significant amount of information. We're going to share some stories as we go through. We've got some questions at the end um, that, that we've already kind of put out there um, just in case we don't have enough from you guys, but we want them from you guys as well. And actually these um, were from you uh, that, that, that we uh, have put in there and, and have some answers for. So uh, so in, uh, in appreciation for your time, let's, uh, let's shoot this forward. Thank you, Dr. McLean. So first wanted to talk briefly, kind of an introduction to fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. And when I say synthetic, that just strictly means it's ma a man-made opioid as opposed to something like morphine, which is a derivative from the poppy plant. Fentanyl is strictly, man it's a man-made and it's what we call an extremely high potency opioid. So it has an extreme strength in terms of binding to the opioid receptors, producing its effect. It is uh, 50 times more strong or more potent than heroin and 100 times more 
potent than morphine. And you'll hear a lot, you know, with, with fentanyl in the news and in different media sources, you know, everyone just kind of throws out the term fentanyl, but no one ever, I don't hear a lot of people delineating whether we're talking about licit or legal pharmaceutical fentanyl or illicit street fentanyl. And obviously there are some major differences there. Um, when you're talking pharmaceutical grade, you're talking, you know, highly regulated that's coming from legitimate, legitimate legal labs. It has been tested in terms of concentration and purity versus something that you're going to be getting from a street lab or a street purchase. And then you're never sure as to what analog you have, what concentration you have. So wildly different. And I think it's always important when you're talking about fentanyl to kind of make that uh, make that delineation, whether you're talking about licit or illicit. But speaking to illicit fentanyl, this is the culprit that is really driving that escalation in overdose deaths across the nation and has been doing so for some time. And unfortunately, it has become the leading cause of death for adult Americans 18 to 45. And the highest group now that we're seeing in terms of overdose deaths secondary to fentanyl is our youth. And that is the most, that's the most rapidly rising overdose death due to fentanyl in terms of youth and young adult ages 14 to 23. And with the youth age group, fentanyl is causing more deaths than heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, prescription medications combined. So this really, this really is the culprit that we have to get a handle on. Next slide. Looking at the scope of the problem from the national and individual state perspective, we know that in the, la the last preliminary data that I saw from the CDC, and that was ending in January, that more than 107,000 people have died secondary to overdose in the, just in the United States alone. 75% of that was due to, or had at least one opioid on board. And almost 67% of those deaths did involve a fentanyl analog. Looking at the state level, you'll see there below, and these are the seven states that Brightview operates in. Moving from a 70% fentanyl involvement in overdose deaths in North Carolina, you're look, it rises up to 94% in Maryland. So this is really, again, just really the culprit driving this rapid escalation and why we're talking, why we're talking about this today. And also this is as we're approaching before we get to the Labor Day holiday, it is International Overdose Awareness Day on August 31st. I know here in Lexington, we will have an event, Lexington, Kentucky is where I am based. And I know many, many communities across the U.S. will actually have, you know, local events and typically their speakers, there may be some harm reduction measures, but it's about honoring those we've lost to the overdose crisis. Next slide. So thinking. No, All right. Yeah, appreciate that. So uh, Addiction 101, what exactly is addiction? Well, you know, I want you to, to kind of step back a little bit um, and think about high blood pressure, think about asthma, think about those chronic conditions um, that we all know about. And I want you to now consider addiction in one of them. It is a chronic disease involving complex interactions among the brain, rewiring of the brain. It involves genetics, environmental changes and exposures, uh, your life uh, or the individual's life experiences. And it can happen to anyone across, uh, across the socioeconomic um, divisions, uh, across um, the races, uh, across, you know, any, it, it can touch anyone and has touched many, many families. And you all probably know of someone that it has touched. Um, risk factors wind up there, genetics about 50%, environmental factors about 50%. So. Uh, you know, one or the other, uh, epigenetics uh, has um, some play in that as well. Prior trauma, early age. I I've had patients tell me their parents sent them out at age five um, with um, a, a, some marijuana and, and their toys to go play by themselves. 
Um, they didn't ask for that. That that was given to them, and, and their parents probably had their parents do that. So no blame here. Um, we're just looking for solutions. Uh, there's also some drug and drug metabolism. There's cultural influence. That's just what we do. You know, that's just what we do in this family. That's kind of uh, you know the, the the way it rolls. Yeah, we could say choice leads to that first use, um, but as we're going to talk about through this, you're going to see that it's not all choice. It, it absolutely isn't once once that first uh, uh, introduction. Um, prevention and treatment approaches for addiction are generally successful. We don't think about that, do we, sometimes? We, we don't think about an addict being able to recover. Sometimes um, we kind of stereotype them. So, so let's open that up and think about that. It's just like any other chronic disease. Uh, you think about diabetes and you think about those folks who, um, you know, constantly their sugar's gone up, they're better, it goes down. Well, this is the same way. Next slide. How, how does it affect the brain? Quite oftentimes we hear about addiction hijacks the brain. And sure, you, you can look at it that way for sure. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about the neurotransmitters. Let's talk about the wiring the, the, and what we hope to have happen at some point is rewiring of that brain. So, so if you look on the left of the side, you're going to see that some of the areas of the brain, these are all um, working together, obviously. And um, what happens with pleasurable uh, activities and some of the, the things that we do is that release of dopamine. Um, from these areas, and, and then they affect that nucleus uh, accumbens. And, and so when, when that dopamine is released, uh, it, it, it's a reward. It causes pleasure. The difference is we all get that release. Um, eating, for example, some other activities. I enjoy riding horses. Um, you probably have a, a hobby that, that does that. The difference is the amount of dopamine that is released. So if you look at in the middle of that slide, it's gonna, it shows you repeat use of substances that markedly release that dopamine, such as heroin, um, such as fentanyl. Um, uh, you know, and, and Dr. Anderson spoke to the potency of that earlier in our discussion. So repeated use results in a decreased response to opioids. So what does that mean? That means we have to use more to get that same response. And part of that is because we're also looking at those dopamine receptors, those, those binding places in that, in that brain um, area that, that take that dopamine and hold on to it. So we're getting decreased receptors downgrading um, with a decreased response. And so we have to have more to have that same response. Decreased dopamine, um, that we see sometimes in, in depression as well, right? You, you know, that kind of goes along with this, causes difficulty with attention, short-term memory, decision-making, feelings of loneliness and low self-esteem. And, and a part of, a huge part of, of recovery is, is getting that back, is, is getting that self-worth um, back. And, and that's a big part of it. I put this little um, graphic in here below. It's actually a video. It's about five minutes. I encourage you to go watch it. Um, it's a bird and he starts out just on a little stroll. He walks by this pile of yellow stuff and first time he goes by it, second time goes by it and he's like, oh, I'm going to try that. And then boy, does that start that pattern. You can see several different times throughout this video. And then all of a sudden he starts crashing and then all of a sudden he needs more and more. It's really humbling, but it brings it home. It's a nice little cartoon. When you get the PDF, um, you'll have that, that um, link there, but you're certainly, you can just Google Nuggets and uh, in YouTube and you'll find it. Next slide. So looking, looking at fentanyl and specifically again, we're, we're speaking to illicit fentanyl, how is there so much? How is, how is fentanyl reaching so many Americans, so many people across the globe and causing such widespread destruction? Initially, we were seeing the majority of fentanyl and what we call fentanyl precursors, those chemicals that are combined to create fentanyl. The majority was coming from labs predominantly in China and then being actually 
sent to China to like a third party intermediary such as Mexico and then coming across the US-Mexico border. And I know now we're seeing an increase in labs um, throughout Mexico and throughout Latin America because that is often an, an, easier, an easier route for direct cross into the US. And where fentanyl is so potent, it takes such a small, it's such a small amount that you can, so it's a drug of choice for smugglers because they can take a small amount of fentanyl and then make, you know, make a very large batch. And what I said there, that the fentanyl is cut in batch. So they'll take the base of their fentanyl and, you know, they'll, they'll take that base and then they'll use different cutting agents. And a lot of times, um, a, a DEA agent that I know, he told me that the com a common thing they'll see is the Nutribullet. So they'll go into these homes and basically, you know, this again, this is not what, this is not what we see when you see a fentanyl uh, pharmaceutical um, in in the street lab or in the street world. They're taking their base fentanyl, throwing it in the Nutribullet with the cutting agent, and then making their big their big batch for distribution. And unfortunately, we don't know what fentanyl they're starting with. Um, fentanyl has a number of different analogs or what I would call siblings. And all of those have different potency, different ability to cause effect, different, uh, different risk of death. So we don't know what we're starting with, don't know what concentration we're starting with. And then we're adding you know, different cutting and agents and throwing all that into the Nutribullet. So we have no idea what that smoothie is going to look like. And, you know, it could be when you batch it out that, you know, these these 10 tablets, these 10 press tablets have all the fentanyl and the rest have all the cutting agent or it could be dispersed. So this creates a higher and higher risk of those what we call the deadly batches. Again, just because don't know what we're starting with and we don't know what we get um, as the end result compared to a pharmaceutical product where you know exactly what you're starting with. And, you, and it is tested for concentration prior to distribution to a hospital or a pharmacy. Here, we, we have no idea. And unfortunately, not only is the fentanyl being, um, being batched out and sold for those seeking opioids, it is also now being added to, to cocaine, to methamphetamine, I heard of one, one instance, and I, I believe it was out of Massachusetts. It was I mean, is it present in counterfeitation. So people will take this fentanyl powder. They'll utilize what's known as a pill press. They'll press that into a tablet. And you know, my, my uh, history as a pharmacist, I've counted thousands of, of opioid tablets. And even to a trained eye, some of these some of these counterfeit medications, these counterfeit tablets or pills, they look identical. So you have you have people on the street that may be seeking, they may be seeking an oxycodone or a Percocet or even even an Adderall um, for performance enhancement prior to a big exam, and what they actually encounter is fentanyl, and it's even more even more risky for those that have zero opioid tolerance. Next slide. So speaking to potency, and again, you know, not knowing what we're starting with and, and the risk, the different risk associated, what are the differences between heroin, fentanyl, and then carfentanyl, which is um, increasing more in the news and different media stories? Looking specifically first there on the far left at, her at heroin, and I did list diamorphine because in the in the Europe, in the UK, this is actually available as a pharmaceutical. So it is the, of the three here, it's the only one that is not synthetic, meaning so it's partially derived from that poppy plant and then partially created in the lab. In the United States, it's a schedule one. So that means it, it has no legal pharmaceutical or medicinal use. And there's the, the formulations that are available for pharmaceutical medicinal use in, in Europe, in the UK. It's available as an injectable solution for pain. And then it's also utilized as a tablet in the treatment of opioid use disorder. 
And in terms of what you'll see from an illicit in the, U in the US, obviously it's not gonna be in our pharmacy or our hospitals. It's gonna be a street product and it's typically uh, a, in either powder or more of a tarry substance. And its potency, usually with opioids, you're always referencing a morphine equivalent or comparing it to morphine. So that's what I did in terms of listing the different potencies Can anyone hear? Yes. yes. Okay, super. Um, Dr. Anderson, I think we um, lost out on some of that, but hopefully everyone got to look at those slides and we can certainly answer that if need be. We froze up a little bit there. So um, uh, here, you know, what's the real risk of, of fake medication? So what, you know, it's a pill, it, it, you know, I can pop it, I can take it, I can do whatever I want, but, but what happens? Um, what happens is you don't know what you're getting, just as Dr. Anderson had just mentioned. Um, you, you know, we're getting these um, pill uh, press uh, uh, machines where they can look exactly like what your prescription looks like. So, um, so when you look at these over to the right here, um, you, you see uh, on the top the authentic uh, oxycodone on, uh, to the left uh, and then the pressed pill on, on that bottom. To the far right is the Xanax bars. See that a lot. Um, in the middle there is Adderall. So, you know, college kids, for example, we're seeing that more and more in some of these college towns. They think they're getting Adderall to stay up at night and study. And in fact, it's pressed uh, fit on in there. There has been some deaths to that. I've actually, uh, actually had a patient come into me and um, over the weekend, she had her friend uh, in her arms died from a pressed um, oxycodone pill. Um, actually, I think that was a Percocet, um, um, same, uh, same idea, but um, so it's out there. It, it's rampant, the, the Xanax, and patients will tell you also, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, I know that it, it, it didn't taste right. It, it wasn't right because I'll share with them, your, your urine toxicology shows me fentanyl. They're like, I didn't take fentanyl. And I'm like, well, all I can do is show you and tell you what it, it shows. And they're like, well, I took a, a Percocet or I, I took a, a Xanax and, and I'll say, well, it was in there. You know, you just don't know what you're getting. We're seeing it laced in, in marijuana, for example. Um, we're seeing it um, in meth. So it is out there. The, the, uh, uh, the drug traffickers are, are trying to make the biggest thing uh, for, their, for their time, uh, the most money. And, and it's resulting in these pills being on the street um, and, uh, and quite a bit of, of deaths associated with it. On the left is some information. Dr. Anderson, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that. No, thank, thank you for picking up there. I apologize, my, uh, my electricity, my whole home just went out. Uh, the joys of, <laughs> the joys of, Ken, of Kentucky living. Um, no, that, was, that was pretty comprehensive. I think just really getting that message out there that if you buy something outside of a pharmacy, you're not getting it from your pharmacy. We really don't know what we're getting. And I think sometimes there are groups of, of, of populations that aren't being educated. You know, I think this should be a part of every, every college orientation, every freshman or a college freshman orientation um, for starting nursing students, medical students, pharmacy students, um, making sure that everyone really understands and can, can speak to and educate about this. And then also, you know, there are folks that may be seeking, again, like I mentioned earlier, for performance enhancement. I know a lot of graduate students that have um, purchased straight Adderall. So they want to do better on their boards or they want to do this. And they have no opioid tolerance. And no one has ever told them, hey, you could be buying fentanyl. 
So I always just like to know, let, let, you know, anyone and everyone, because there is no, no group that's immune to this risk if you purchase outside of a pharmacy. And that's why I think it's so important to, to educate and then also talk about, you know, fentanyl testing scripts for utilization. If you buy medication outside of a pharmacy, it is really easy to, to stop and, and utilize a fentanyl testing strip and be able to know for certain that that's not what you're going to encounter when you take that particular medication. Next slide. So we wanted to go through, I think it's important uh, talking about, you know, facts and myths specific to, to fentanyl. And I know I've seen a lot of news stories in terms of, you know, even, even touching fentanyl. And this comes into play when we're, you know, providing support during an overdose, but even, even coming into contact with fentanyl can cause death. And that is, that is, a, that is a myth. Even touching fentanyl powder is not going to cause death. Administering um, rescue breathing or providing overdose support. If you come into contact, skin to skin contact, I'm not talking about powder to a mucous membrane, but just skin to skin to fentanyl contact is not going, is not a risk. The way that, you know, there are fentanyl patches pharmaceutical fentanyl patches, but they, they utilize some pretty high tech technology to get that fentanyl across and into our bloodstream. So that incidental skin exposure, extremely unlikely to, to, to cause a problem. However, you know, just to be on the safe side, you know, anytime you're providing that support or those rescue breathings, uh, rescue breaths during overdose reversal, um, be aware, understand, understand the risk. And I think if you utilize, you know, standard safety precautions, and once you have provided those breasts, provided that overdose support, you know, wash your hands, any exposed services with soap and water. And use soap and water and not an alcohol base. So don't use, you know, the hand sanitizers that are everywhere since the pandemic. Because alcohol, if you have a fentanyl powder on your skin or a mucous membrane, alcohol will actually help that, um, help that fentanyl if, you, if it was transferred to um, be disseminated through the skin or through the mucous membrane. So it actually does increase the risk. So soap and water is best. Next slide. So the next myth, um, did somebody have a question? I'm oh, sorry, I thought I heard, I thought I heard someone. So the, the second myth I think it's important uh, to talk about is I hear a lot of people saying that fentanyl is narcan resistant or carfentanil or, you know, feral fent the, all the fentanyl siblings that are available now that, that they're narcan quote resistant. And that is a myth. In reality, fentanyl or any, in any fentanyl analog, they're opioids. So by nature, naloxone when administered is going to kick that opioid off the receptor. Now you do have some fentanyl analogs and particularly some of the ones that are that are we're seeing in the street now in terms of acro fentanyl, feral fentanyl, they will bind the opioid receptor tighter and you may have to use you know a higher dose of naloxone or multiple repeated, um, I'm hearing that commonly that you're having multiple doses. And if a patient comes through the emergency department, a lot of times they're just started on a naloxone infusion. Um, and that is, it does provide that additional support if you have a, high, a higher potency or a fentanyl or other opioid that tightly binds. But the reality is fentanyl overdoses can be reversed. And if you suspect an overdose, administer that naloxone, administer that Narcan, and go ahead and, and call, you know, call for backup, call 911 um, and get me EMS support there. They often have multiple doses available. And, you know, if you do not have multiple doses available, just, you know, again, administer what you have and provide supportive care until emergency medical services arrive. Next slide.
So after we've provided that, provided the naloxone, reversed that overdose, what's next? And this is this slide is speaking to what happens what happens after an overdose in the community, as opposed to what we would do inside of a hospital. Uh, anytime someone experiences an overdose, that is a moment of crisis. However, moments of crisis are often what presents or what prompts the opportunity for change. So what that is, you know, there, there's the positive, the, the positive light there is if, if an overdose is reversed and a patient survives, if a patient is alive, they have the opportunity to recover. Dr. Anderson, I'll, uh, I'll uh, go through this. Sure. Um, I appreciate that that introduction there. The, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, whenever we have a, uh, an overdose, it, it's a time that, that we can focus in, offer our services, and, and, and show that patient a different path. However, if you're around there when a patient has that overdose and is given that naloxone, uh, be prepared for not some nice words, be prepared for some anger, agitation, even severe sickness. So what happens is, as Dr. Anderson mentioned, um, when you give that naloxone, it, it, we talk about it kicking off, kicking off that fentanyl. Well, all of a sudden that, that blocker, the naloxone is the blocker. So those um, uh, euphoria, those effects, those intensity are, are gone all of a sudden. And, and it throws these people into what we call PIWD, uh, precipitated induced withdrawal sy um, uh, syndrome. So, so what happens is they go right into it. it it's the worst. It's, it, it's, it's not the same as um, that um, fentanyl or the heroin or the opiate slowly coming off. It's acute. So what do we do? We give them uh, encouragement. We stay with them. We talk to them. Um, we we give them a repeat dose, as Dr. Anderson mentioned, if if we if we need to. I, I've seen uh, been in, uh, associated with with patients who needed up to six or more. Um, at one point, I had a, a patient who was a nurse who was doing IV fentanyl during the day. Um, she was sent away um, because of investigation. She went immediately um, bought some, um, some heroin, it was fentanyl, went to, thank goodness, a nurse's uh, a colleague, did it there immediately, uh, cardiac arrest. She required six doses and, uh, and almost at that last dose, um, the ER physician was, was gonna call it, but um, thank goodness they did it. She proceeded in recovery and is, is doing great. So what else can we do? We can do a warm handoff. What does that mean? Well, that means you're not just giving them a piece of paper. You're not just sending them out with a number. You're actually maybe even taking them to that person. You're taking them to the counselor. You're, you're calling and, and getting an appointment for them. Um, you're, you're, you're giving them some, some hope and, and helping them find that path. Um, some of the things that we talk about, emergency department-based screening and referral of the expert screening tool, um, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. I'm going to go through these quite quick, quickly. Emergency department based on the lock zone provision, take home Narcan. Biggest thing that, that, that can help prevent uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the overdose. Post overdose outreach and follow up. This is a team approach. Some call it the knock and talk. It's generally maybe a counselor and a police or a fire person. They go to the person's home and say, hey, what can we do? Let's get you there. Uh, let's let's help you. There's a great little link there to uh, to some of this information that I encourage you to go look at. Uh, if available, provide a, you know, and this is an addition to that warm handoff, but, but go ahead and give them an updated available uh, resource um, uh, page uh, where they can access some of those things, um, you know, locally, peer recovery, huge, huge. No one can talk to a person using drug or, or is having some difficulty in here than someone who has experienced it. Peer recovery, that is um, an, an, an awesome resource. Um, finally, you wanna uh, maybe assess that person's need for transportation. Is there something that, that we could do um, to be helpful to get them where they need to go? Because a lot of times these folks are financially strapped. Um, they've lost their car, they've lost everything and, and they need help getting on that path. So you can go to that next slide. And Cheryl, it looks like we had some questions in the chat. Oh, I saw, sure. I saw there was a question. The first question was, 
how soon after someone overdoses do we have to administer naloxone? I can answer that or I'll, I'll let you. Immediately. I mean, ideally, as soon as you see that happen, obviously, but, um, you know, the, the brain can sustain a certain amount of, of lack of oxygen. So it depends on um, the support, you know, those ABCs, airway, um, breathing and circulation. So, um, you know, so that that's what uh, some of the things that we want to do is we want to support that. And, uh, you know, until that naloxone can be delivered. Like Dr. McLean said, really as soon, literally as soon as possible. And that's why I do so much advocacy really around getting naloxone everywhere. Because it's the sooner you administer it, the sooner you restore oxygen to the brain, the better. So literally, if you've got it on board, you know, don't hesitate. Naloxone is one of the safest, safest medications. If you give it to someone and it's not an opioid overdose, it will not harm them. And that kind of feeds into the, the second question I saw, Cheryl, was how many, how many doses of naloxone could be administered by someone in the community? As many as it takes. I, I've heard up to 10. So, um, you know, now think back, some of the, you know, this Narcan naloxone has been around uh, in somebody's purse or in somebody's car and maybe isn't as... Um, uh, um, in, in strong as it was initially, um, I would still use those uh, if that's all you have, but, but as many as it takes. I think there may be, let's see. Okay, well, there's one, lot, one, one more question before we move to the next slide is, why do they put fentanyl into other street drugs? So cost, they want the biggest bang for the buck. They also want to, um, so if, if you're a drug dealer and you've got some good stuff and those people uh, that are buying it from you uh, get that word out, hey, go see so-and-so, that stuff is really, uh, you know, it, it's really intense. Um, it's all the bottom line. Capitalism. <laughs> Next. So here's some stories. Um, and, and I hear these a lot. I was revived with Narcan and, and, and that what happens afterwards. So I had mentioned, you know, people are not happy sometimes. Um, there are some though that are, that are very appreciative. So in the upper left-hand corner, I had been in a coma. Most people aren't as lucky and blessed as I have been. I know a lot of people who've fallen out and that's one of the terms um, and are no longer here. I, I cannot tell you the, the number of patients I see whom they have no more high school friends. They're the last one of their family. That's another one. Um, their brother, sister's father. Um, the, the other thing that's just, uh, you know, is when a, a mom comes in and, and her children, it's her children that she's lost. Um, so, uh, so for someone to, uh, you know, to, to be revived and have another chance, that, that's all we need is let's, let's give them that chance. The lower left above anything, you are amazing for what you did. Do not ever let someone shame you for, for saving your life. And, th and that happens. Um, some of these, uh, you, you know, when they're, when they're revived, they get upset and mad. And how could you do that? You know, how could you take away that, that buzz or, or that high or, or that feeling? You know, why did you do it? This person goes on to say, um, you are so amazing for what you did. So do, you, you know, we just do what's right. To the right, after waking up from an overdose, I'm, I'm agitated and usually arguing this person is being accountable uh, and being defensive about using and, and was trying any way to get away uh, from them as soon as possible so they could go do it again. And, and that's, that's what happens. You hear that a lot from first responders. These folks don't want to go to the emergency room. They don't want to go um, get help. They, they want to go use again. But, but why do they want to go use again? Because they're miserable. Remember, we talked about that PIWD and how miserable that is, acute withdrawals, miserable. So they want to go back and, and they'll do anything, um, just like Nugget, they'll do anything to, to, to get through that. So next slide. What does it look like when, when we do have some success recovery? Um, what's it look like? The immediate response? Well, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see that, that fentanyl in the urine uh, for a, a few days, even maybe longer than 72 hours. It lasts a, a, a lot. It, it's, um, 
lipophilic, so it, it lives in the adipose of the fat tissue, so it, it can stay up there, especially if you're doing some hair tests, it can stay even longer. Um, we know anyone can fully recover from a, a fentanyl addiction, any addiction, and go on to live a healthy, uh, a productive, uh, gainful, uh, high quality life. Everyone's recovery looks different. So what's right for one isn't right for the next. You've got to find uh, with maybe some motivational interviewing, what drives that person? How can you get them to see the light? How, how can you do that? So what are some of the things that is a positive outcome that you can kind of focus on? Hey, um, mending relationships with family and friends is huge, huge. Uh, a lot of times the people using drugs, they've, they've exhausted every single um, uh, link out there, you know, uh, to, uh, with family and friends. Picking up uh, old healthy hobbies and habits that used to make you happy, you know, um, maybe uh, jogging again or, or knitting or whatever, regaining custody of children, huge motivation, huge motivation. Love that. That's one of my, my favorite things to be involved in when, when people uh, using drugs get their kids back because they've been on that path of recovery and have been successful. Gainful employment, expunging criminal records, probation, uh, legal issues resolved, exercising, we kind of touched on that, paying off debts, being gainfully employed, now being able to get a car, um, opening a savings, having a checking account, basically just living like the rest of us normally do. Next slide. So looking at, you know, one ways that we help, we help people stay alive to be able to recover is through harm reduction. And Brightview, we, we deploy what we, we consider a harm reduction focus or a harm reduction centered model. And really for us as treatment providers, that means it's we're non-punitive. We're going to meet you where you are and support you what, you know, what if, you know, whatever that path or however many times that takes. Unfortunately, I still see a lot of, of centers in a lot of areas where unless someone remains completely abstinent and they're coming back in, you know, always with negative urine toxicology, they're kicked out from the program. And I'm like, I don't know any other, any other health condition that we require perfection. It's so, so, so why we singled this out and we're you know, like, you know, immediately you've got to, you've, you've got to be perfect right off the bat or we're not going to help you. And usually early on, someone is the most vulnerable. They need the most support. They need the most grace. They need the most compassion. And that's kind of what, that's the, that's our focus at, right? You is, is, is harm, is harm reduction and harm reduction in general means, you know, reducing, re reducing harm associated with any risk. Um, wearing seatbelts while driving, that's harm reduction. It's reducing the risk associated with a car crash. Um, when we're talking about substance use disorder, what are the known risks of, of, you know, of substance use? Be that opioids, you know, injection opioids, particular, you're looking at, you know, wound infection, skin infection, overdose, transmission of hepatitis or HIV. Um, so, those are some of the, some of the known risks. So knowing those risks, how do we prevent them? And fortunately now there are more quote harm reduction community centers or harm reduction programs than ever. And it varies wild, you know, wildly state to state, um, depending upon statute policy. And um, unfortunately in certain states, Fentanyl testing, state of Ohio, fentanyl testing strips. There, there's a uh, piece of legislation right now that's being considered it, because those are still considered illegal. So, you know, even though they, they provide, you no, know, they're, they're not a drug. And I've never seen anyone see a fentanyl testing strip and be like, today is the day. I see a testing strip, I must use, you know. <laughs> we see fast food restaurants every day and we don't, you know, we, you know, we don't pull over immediately. Uh, for those cheeseburgers. So I don't know why we, we believe that providing people with safe equipment, safe education, re-engaging them is going to encourage drug use. There's not been any study that I have seen um, that says that, you know, that has actually collected the data showing that harm reduction encourages or enables use. What it does is reconnect 
for many, it's the first, the first bit of compassion, the first uh, time someone's looked them in the eye in, in, in years. And um, you're literally, you're meeting them where they are and providing the patient with what they're, what they're looking for that day. Um, for some, it may be a referral to treatment. For others, it may just be clean supplies or naloxone or just take some resources or supplies for, for, their, uh, for their friends. You are offering a, a wide array of services and letting the patient engage and choose and have some empowerment. And um, I did put there the second, the second bullet point is abstinence should not be a requirement for participation. Unfortunately, there are still are some programs in parts of the US that do require abstinence um, to be part of their participation and their, they have that as the only goal. Um, you know, my, my personal thought is, you know, it's the, the only goal should be enabling breathing and enabling connection and distributing compassion and letting people know they matter and letting people bring in hope. And for maybe for some to, again, believe that medical professionals and community professionals actually care about them. I think that's kind of the first step to recovery. And um, that's, part of, that's part of harm reduction. And it can be as simple as connecting to community resources up to what's known as safe consumption sites. I know that those are under uh, operating in New York and California did just pass legislation. I'm not sure if Governor Newsom has signed that yet, but California looks to be the second state to offer safe consumption site operation. And to my knowledge in the state of New York, in the months that they've been operating the safe consumption site where folks can come, they're bringing their own product, they're, they're consuming that in, um, in an area that is safe with clean supplies around medical professionals that can reverse an overdose. There's not been any overdose deaths in, those safe, in that safe consumption site in New York. There've been many overdoses, but no deaths. So what harm reduction does is it reduces the number of overdoses, reduces the deaths, decreases the risk of uh, transmission of different viral diseases. And again, re it re reconnects, which I think sometimes that's the most important part, reconnection and letting people know, hey, I care about you. And I'm gonna support you regardless of what your, your path to recovery or your, just your path to safer use looks like. Next slide. And tying, tying that harm reduction, harm reduction into advocacy. Like I said, harm reduction and even addiction treatment, behavioral health looks so different state to state. In any other area of medicine, um, a heart attack where I'm at in Lexington, Kentucky, will be treated like a heart attack in New York, will be treated like a heart attack in California. It is a medical illness. If it has the same underlying cause, it's gonna be treated the same. With opioid use disorder, it, it, no two days, no two, pick, no, no two centers in the same city may approach it the same and uh, much less deliver any measure of quality of care. And the way we change that, one, one way I believe is, you know, is establishing policy and changing legislation to ensure and, and uh, mandate that people are offered evidence-based care and ensuring they are they receive quality care. And we need as much, you know, I want to put a help needed on this slide, you know, as many advocates as possible, because I think there's power in numbers. Um, we need people, you know, the, I advocate for Shatterproof at the national level, for NAMI, for several different groups. Um, so I'm a registered state and federal lobbyist, just trying to drive these changes. Um, so that addiction is treated like any other healthcare illness. And some of the things I think, you know, some of the basic changes I would like to see, and I'd like to see in my lifetime. I'm one of those folks that Dr. McLean was speaking to. I've lost one third of my high school graduating class, uh, five family members, and um, up to there's 17 of my, my inner, my circle. Um, it is every holiday, every couple of months, it is unfortunately another death. And I think until we see some of these basic changes, ensuring quality care, standard of care, 
making sure our healthcare professionals are educated. Um, in pharmacy school or medical school, I received, I did not receive any lectures on substance use disorder. In my clinical rotations, I saw a lot of, here's how we negatively, negatively reinforce to the patients. When they come through the emergency department, we're gonna slam naloxone. We're gonna make them have the most negative experience. It's the reason patients will choose. They'll know they have a skin infection. They will wait until they're unconscious and somebody else takes them because they will not. They're not going through the emergency room. There's nothing worth how they're gonna be treated there. And a lot of my friends in recovery, they still won't go 10, 15, 20 years out. Their medical, their healthcare experience was so negative, they still won't engage. So we want to provide education and make sure our healthcare professionals are treating this patient population with compassion and respect. Uh, we wanna increase the workforce, increase what nurse practitioners, physician assistants are able to do in terms of treating addiction, making sure that medications are available, making sure that naloxone is available. I feel like we have defibrillators everywhere. So should naloxone. Naloxone should be everywhere. It's one of the safest medications, doing a lot of work getting it into our schools. We're seeing middle schoolers. Middle schoolers are dying now and there's no naloxone to be found. And I know the state of Kentucky, there was a bill in this most past, uh, most uh, recent general assembly. And unfortunately it never even made it to committee. And it was just going, the bill was only asking to put naloxone, one to two doses of naloxone into our schools. Because if it's not there and a child overdoses, they're likely either going to pass away or have a brain injury from lack of oxygen by the time EMS is able to get there, by the time they get to the community hospital. Let's get naloxone into our schools and let's decriminalize and expand harm reduction. And last but not least, I think first and foremost, let's all continue to do what we can to fight stigma. Next slide. We can make a difference. Um, one of the questions that just I saw came up kind of uh, uh, asks is what, uh, what do you feel, I'm going to the question here, what do you feel uh, specifically something healthcare providers like our Brightview folks um, could do to help educate the patients um, and, uh, and decrease the prevalence uh, of this issue? Well, um, one of the big things I think is in that is, is this issue of, I don't, we don't know what you're getting. You don't know what you're getting. These pressed pills, they, are, they look so good that people don't, don't know. And so educating that telling them about their urine toxicology. Did you know that this showed that? And actually showing it to them because they're going, I don't know, I never, well, here, let me show it to you. All I can do is show you what this shows. Um, so basically education, reassuring, utmost show respect, courtesy, non-judgmental when we talk to them, understand that they're gonna go through the, 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 the woes, and, you know, waxes and the wings. They're gonna have a good week, they're gonna have a bad week. They're gonna have a, two good weeks, maybe one bad week. And we have to be there with them. We can't get our own bias in there. We can't get our own frustrations. We can't bring stuff from home and, and, uh, and, and help them. So we need to, uh, to just be there for them. Great question. So um, we asked patients at Brightview, uh, what, what are some of the things um, you know, that, um, that you've seen about your recovery? So what did your friends, family, and the community most misunderstand about recovery? Well, we're not bad people. We're just trying to get good. Just sick people who want to get well, they understand that they don't make this choice anymore. Um, their brain is not their friend. I tell them that all the time. Your brain is not your friend. You can make, a, a, you know, you might be thinking it, that cognitive behavioral therapy, use those tools, do a different behavior. You know, break that thought. Brain's not your friend. Um, let's go, what helps keep you in recovery? I was tired of being tired. I had reached rock bottom rock bottom, homeless shelter, lost my wife, you hear this all the time, lost everything. Um, I, I either had to change or die like the rest of my friends. And I hear that too. I, I just don't want to die. This person said, didn't sound, dying doesn't sound like much fun. Um, how would your friends and family say you've changed most during your recovery? This is, this is big. I'm more honest and dependable. They can finally now be accountable and, and uh, take care of their children. Um, have a gainful employment, get that financial security so that they can get their own home, um, you know, and, and then finally, I actually want to live. 
and have begun to love me. Huge. Next slide. So this, this slide is, does a tr addiction treatment work? And this is a quick summary. I know we only have uh, five or six minutes until we reach that, uh, reach the one o'clock hour. So try to walk through this quickly. Bright, this is from our Brightview patients, uh, Brightview patients out of Ohio. And we wrote a white paper summarizing the results. Or if anyone is interested, can provide provide the link to that that white paper as well. And we were able to collect data on our patients and show what changes can occur um, when patients are able to get into treatment, stay into treatment, and um, looking at kind of looking at the the measure. This is referring to measurement based care. What what are the measures that we say um, addiction treatment works? Because like with diabetes, you may look at hemoglobin A1C, different, different uh, health conditions have measures that you would say treatment is working or it's not. Um, addiction treatment, we're still trying, you know, still trying to iron out uh, what is successful treatment. Um, we one of the, some audiences, this is as uh, controversial in terms of abstinence. Uh, we were able to show in our patient population in the first 90 days, um, 70, there was 70 percent decreased illicit use. That's substantial um, with many patients reaching that complete abstinence. Um, in, that, or in that first 90 days, we had a one-third decrease in ER visits. We had, you know, patients having decreased arrest, uh, increased engagement with their families. Within six months, unemployment decreased by 50%. Um, patients are starting to increase uh, their participation or re-engage with the uh, primary care or other medical providers. So again, in three to six months, are they're having decreased illicit use, they're visiting the ER less, they're re-engaging with other healthcare professionals, they're re-engaging with their family, their friends, um, becoming a member of the recovery community, becoming and getting getting employed. Um, those are, that's the foundation is really get, you know, being able to get employed, reconnect, put a roof over your head. Those are the, 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 the basics, that foundation of recovery. And um, we were able to show that getting people into treatment and helping them stay there, they were able to accomplish that. So we, we really believe addiction treatment works. We just got to be able to make it more available to those that are seeking it. Next slide. So now we've got, we've got three minutes for questions, Cheryl. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go through those one that we have there. And then okay. if anyone has one, um, I'm watching it over here as well. So yeah, I can say, you know, we've got three minutes until one. And so we understand that you guys may have to, you may have to step off. We're going to walk through some more questions. What are you um, looking at, bro? I'm sorry, what? I think that might have been an accident. Okay. All right. So one of the questions uh, was fit on pregnancy. So if you look to the left, uh, we do see an increased risk in um, poor fetal growth, um, stillbirth, preterm delivery, fetal distress during labor. Although although that may be more with heroin based, but but regardless, we, we still could see that. And then of course the neonatal abstinence syndrome um, that is not related to uh, dose. Of, uh, of MAT, um, you know, lower dose, higher dose doesn't matter. During pregnancy, we, op we often have to go up to that higher dose. That doesn't mean mom is being uh, negligent or wanting to use. It just means there's a change of metabolism. And, uh, and, and those uh, urges and cravings are real when we have to go up on the dose. It doesn't mean baby has more uh, neonatal uh, abstinence syndrome risk. Um, so we have to encourage and, and uh, educate our, our moms on that so that we can keep them out of harm's way. We do know that MAT gives higher, better outcomes than, uh, than not using MAT if you're going to use. So does not increase the risk for infertility, miscarriage, or birth defects. Um, and we don't really know if it's behavior or uh, learning disabilities increase with its, with its use. Next slide. So, um, Dr. Anderson, uh, chime in here at any time. Um, sure. 
Sure. Um, looking, you know, in terms of routine drug testing, and when you say routine, or, you know, a lot of times we're referencing the um, what we the the the, the, the potty and dipstick. Um, obviously, the the cheaper the test, the more narrow the things that you're able to nor you're testing for, and the greater the concentration will be required to test positive. Um, you know, at a treatment center, we do what is uh, known as uh, gas from liquid, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. Literally, it is, that's a chemical process where whatever is in the urine, you can identify um, in a lab. That is extremely costly and requires a specific lab. So, you know, there was a question directly, why is fentanyl not uh, part of hospital testing routine? Well, it, that requires that the patient's only going to be there a small amount of time that would require if the hospital isn't a large academic institution, it would have to be a send out. So your utility there, if someone's coming through an overdose, coming in for an overdose to the emergency department, we're gonna treat that like an opioid overdose. It's gonna be that supportive care and we're going to treat that pretty much the same. And then if, you know, obviously on the back end, that could be a send out. There's not really a, a utility or a need to know specifically what opioid that is, what concentration. Now, if, a, if you've got a professional, maybe in a physician's health program or, um, you know, a nurse going through the recovery process, they're often going to have that hair testing, have that, uh, that, that gas chromatography mass spec that's going to capture whatever substances are there. But in terms of um, what is the, the, the basic, the, the basic, and they're listed there, and those are the five that are, that are pretty much required when someone is in a, uh, a substance use disorder treatment program. And those are, that is what we test for um, at Brightview as part of our, our basic tests. And then we, we are every, depending on what, what state we're in, um, every state has different mandates, different cutoffs um, in terms of concentration that you have to test down to. Um, it really, again, this is an area for the legislative policy change is, is much needed. Dr drug testing can be a, a, an hour or six all on its own. Next slide. Um, and I know right. we we've probably hit that hour, but we're going, we're going to continue. Um, feel free if you have to hop off, we're going to uh, make these, the materials available to everyone, but we're going to go ahead and finish, finish out these questions. So if you have the time, hang around with us. Um, otherwise, we'll get the materials out to you. Go ahead, Dr. McLean. Thanks. So recognizing uh, opioid overdose, um, what's it look like if you come up on someone new? You know, we've kind of talked about what to do. Um, to the left, it's going to say one of the major characteristics of this is it's fast. It's fast. So, so th these folks, they're 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 gone. They're limp. They're they're out almost uh, seconds, uh, milliseconds, maybe minutes, but but generally fast. If you come up on someone, you didn't see it. What 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 might you see? They're going to be um, generally on their side. Uh, they might be slumped over. They might you know you might still see the, the needle in their arm, the needle laying next to them. Um, their face could be pale, clammy to touch. Uh, they're going to be limp, fingernails, lips blue or purple, not getting that oxygen. They might be vomiting or gurgling sounds. If they are vomiting, turn them on their side, um, left side typically, um, and, and help that um, prevent them, uh, them choking on their own vomit. They can't be awakened or they cannot speak. Um, breathing slows or is stopped and the heart slows or stops uh, and there's no pulse. Next slide. Preventing overdose, um, number one, number one, number one, get that Narcan out there, naloxone. Um, there are other brands, Narcan is a brand name. Um, there are other, um, other brands. Uh, there's actually one now that, um, that has a higher dose in it uh, than, the, than the first one that came out with, uh, with the brand name Narcan. So uh, nearly 40% of overdose deaths occur while someone is present. Um, so there's an opportunity if you don't have that Narcan, uh, you know, do the do as much uh, of the first responder ABC um, uh, support 
life, uh, basic life support as, as you know and are comfortable with. Be respectful and non-judgmental. Educate. So um, local resources talk about uh, harm reduction, uh, like we talked about a little bit today, uh, in form of MAT options, treatment centers that take walk-ins, for example, uh, reputable sober, sober living housing, and, and maybe the 12-step programs. For persistent users, and, and this is hard for some of us to do because, because we don't want them to use, and so you feel like you might be condoning if, if you say these things, but you're not, you're helping them, you're educating them, you're giving them another chance to get back in and, and allow uh, the team to, to get that on that pathway. So what are the, some of the things um, you can ask them, you know, anticipate possible fentanyl laced substances. We've talked about that, those breath pills, um, the marijuana, the, the uh, meth, we've seen it and all that. Um, tell them to be alert to that different response that different taste, that different color. I hear that all the time. You know, I knew it wasn't, uh, it wasn't what I thought it was because it just didn't, you know, it, it didn't give me the same um, reaction or the, or the same feeling and it, and it tasted different. Start with a small amount, test it out, especially if you, um, if, if you have a new drug dealer, you don't know that person or you're getting it from someone that, you know, got it from someone else that you don't know. Uh, start with a small amount. Uh, remember, tolerance and, and level that and we don't know what that um, what that uh, illicit functional uh, the milligrams of it exactly so uh, remember that neutral bullet story from uh, Dr. Anderson uh, yeah avoid using alone just like my nurse um, she knew to go um, she went to a colleague and did it at her house and had she not done that she wouldn't be here, she wouldn't have been given the opportunity. Now, that nurse didn't, didn't have um, naloxone. Um, she used uh, the, the uh, she just did resuscitation and obviously called 911 very quickly and they got there quickly. Um, but um, but she wouldn't have that opportunity. There is a, there's a number now that you can call. It's a, it's a national um, toll free number that you can call so that you don't, no one has to use alone. So they may not feel comfortable going to a friend or a family, but they can call. And um, they and there's there are apps and there's a lot of different technology that if you don't there are um, there are ways to do you know to do that in the least intrusive way possible and also there's there are um, depending upon the state in the state of Kentucky there's a website and I've actually utilized this um, it's from the Kentucky Harm Reduction Group you go on online and you request naloxone. And they'll send you naloxone mail to your house. So you get two doses of naloxone, you get fentanyl testing strips and education. Um, so always, you know, I, I think it, depending upon the state, the state, I know you can do that in Ohio in terms of mail order. Um, there are so many ways to get, get these materials out there. And I try to, you know, tell this to, to anyone who's persistently using, tell, you know, and tell, tell your friends that, you know, maybe you don't want to come into our clinic or you don't want to go into the emergency department. You don't have to. Um, here are some resources, and you can you can make that um, make that request. Um, so it's it's been pretty awesome to see all the different ways technology is being used to save lives. That's an awesome addition, and maybe we could put that number in there, um, Katie, um, uh, to, to on this slide so folks can can have that, and maybe some of the links to those resources you talked about. That, that's great. Um, big thing, do not combine with other substances. Deadly benzodiazepines, alcohol, um, gabapentin. Amazing, the number of gabapentin, the milligrams. Um, I have people tell me they put, uh, you know, 10, 800 gabapentin um, in with all this other stuff. So um, most overdose deaths do involve more than one substance. And most of them, or many of them, have the benzodiazepine. Um, <clears throat> benzodiazepines, Valium, Xanax, um, um, Ativan, Diazepam, Lorazepam, um, and uh, Alprazolam are the, are the generic names. Naloxone, 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 get it out there. I carry it with me, um, have it. One big, uh, just note, post-incarceration, I saw that we had a parole officer, uh, a probation officer, uh, just uh, uh, thank us and, and thank you if you're still here. Uh, for joining us, but um, post-incarceration. So remember, folks go in um, with this tolerance. They're there for 30 days. They don't get their um, drug of choice. They might 
occasionally get something, but they don't, they're certainly not, um, not building, you know, not using daily. And so that tolerance goes back down. They come out, they don't know it. They have no tolerance. They go right back to using what they were using and they're gone. High, high risk. Um, off the top of my head, I, I want to say it's like 40 times higher in the first four weeks. But I think of too, Dr. Mahalo, I was trying to think of what's that in those first two weeks post-release. Yeah. Is it's that's the most dangerous, most dangerous time. And yeah. uh, an area of advocacy, if anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm trying to do is, is, is Medicaid expansion, getting that on board to those that are coming out of uh, long term jail or long term prison is getting Medicaid enrollment prior to release. Um, my first cousin's been eight years in a state uh, state prison here in Kentucky. He was able, because this was a, I think this was a Medicaid waiver, was able to get Medicaid enrolled prior to his release. He had coverage for a year. He was able to have a, an appointment set up prior to release, and he utilized, he utilized Vivitrol, um, and, and that's very expensive, and it was covered because he was enrolled. So if anybody wants to, to join in the fight to making sure that those coming out can actually participate in healthcare, even despite their limited resources, reach out, there's strength in numbers and I need more people on my team. <laughs> there's also um, a HRSA grant uh, that was, uh, I think it's, um, oh, it was a significant amount of money in Eastern Kentucky and it's called a first day forward. And what they do is that first day they, they get these um, incarcerated folks who are released and they, um, they give them naloxone, they, they give them, uh, uh, basically clothes, uh, anything they need. They set up resources because what happens is these folks get out, they're given their same, in, uh, the same stuff that they were arrested, or, you know, and so if they're getting out in the fall, but, or the winter, and, and it was the spring that, that they were, um, you, you know, and they've got shorts and that sort of thing, that's what they get back. So, and then who do they call? They call the people that they know and generally knows, gets them right back into that pattern. So, Next slide. This is, we can just look at it real quickly. It's not, it, I threw it in there if anyone had any questions about the difference in the affinities. It's actually opposite of what it looks like. Uh, the, the buprenorphine has the highest affinity. I know it's the lowest, but they're looking at it a different way. So you go down, um, you know, that gives you an idea of uh, hydromorphone is, is under, is next in line, oxy. Morphone and then the morphine. Um, heroin is broken down into morphine and uh, 6-MAM, uh, the metabolite. Don't ask me what that is. I bet our chemist probably knows. But uh, uh, And then the fentanyl is right in the middle and then oxycodone and the hydrocodone, which is Wartab, Vicodin. And then you've got your codeine, which is the least, um, the, the, the least binding affinity. Affinity means how, how hard that substance holds on to that receptor in your body. So um, buprenorphine um, likes it pretty well. It's important to show there because fentanyl, you know, fentanyl having a higher number means it binds less tighter. Again, therefore it, it can be displaced. The, the, that lower number, the tighter something binds. So the buprenorphine or the suboxone subsolve, it has an extremely low, num low binding number. It means it binds the receptor so tight buprenorphine overdoses are actually extremely challenging. And we see that a lot in our pediatric. Um, when, when some of the buprenorphine products, unfortunately do come in, do are left where children can, can consume them, buprenorphine overdoses are some of the most challenging. They usually require naloxone grip and that's just because it does bind so tight. But fentanyl, that higher number, binds, it, it can be displaced by Narcan. Next slide. That's just our contact. It's just our contact information. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I know we did we did go over. Um, so thank you for those that stayed with us. Feel free to to reach out directly um, to us. Reach out to the organizers of the webinar, and we will get get the slides out and get the resources. Uh, the resources out to everyone. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you all.
next week.